to the ICAEW Insights in Focus podcast. Hello and welcome to this ICAW Insights podcast. Today we're talking about gender diversity on boards, ensuring women's full and effective participation and providing equal opportunities for leadership in political, economic and public life are a key component of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Yet data continues to show that women are constrained from achieving the highest leadership positions in the corporate world. Globally, only 23% of boardroom seats in the largest public companies are held by women. The figures do vary significantly region by region. But to quote Pumzili Malambo Nukuga, Executive Director of UN Women, speaking at the recent Generational Equality Forum in Paris, one quarter isn't equality, equality is one half. Achieving gender parity in economic decision making is still far off. In this episode, we're going to take the opportunity to focus on what is changing when it comes to women on boards and why it matters. We're going to reflect on recent developments in different parts of the world, and we're going to consider different approaches to accelerate change. My name is Susanna Di Felice Antonio, and I'm Head of European Affairs at ICAW. I'm delighted to be co-hosting this session with Jane Burney, Business Law Manager at ICAW. Hello. For this episode, we're speaking to Andrew Weir, Regional Senior Partner of KPMG in Hong Kong and Vice Chairman of KPMG China and Global Chair of Asset Management for KPMG. Leda Kondoyani, Chair of the Non-Executive Directors Club in Greece and Board Member of ECODA, the umbrella organisation representing the main national institutes of directors in Europe. Catherine Muzakali, Advocate of the High Court of Kenya and Chairperson Women on Boards Network in Kenya. And Susanna Han, a non-profit leader currently holding a portfolio of non-executive director roles. It's great to have you all with us here today. Let me kick off by asking each one of you what your interest, whether professional or personal, is in this topic. And perhaps, Andrew, I could invite you to share your thoughts first. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be on this podcast and the ICAW reach globally is fantastic. So greeting from Hong Kong. I'm very interested in the women on boards as a concept because corporate governance is a major interest of mine and diversity of perspectives and board decision making is so important. And so I think really diversity of perspective and women on boards is, is vitally important to governance. Leda, what's your interest in this topic? Could you share that with us? Yeah, thank you, Susanna. Thank you. My interest is um, similar to Andrew's because um, I feel that uh, better governance leads to better decisions and then better financial results or for companies. But on top of that, I think that for women on board, there's still barriers. And last but not least, it's a women's issue still, unfortunately. It's not a men's problem. Men do not see that there is a problem. So I think this problem in all. Thank you, Leda. Catherine? Thank you very much. As uh, my name suggests, I am the chairperson of the Women on Boards Network. So this is really at the core of what I do. And gender parity studies across the world have shown that when you have gender parity on boards, organizations perform much, much better. And, and that's why I am very, very interested in these topics. Thank you, Catherine. And Susanna? I think I've been active in the governance space over the past 20 years, probably, looking at the company, the investor, the regulator side. And I think it's an interesting area to see the growth of interest from companies, from investors, for how involving women, how great a diversity can feed into business performance. Wonderful. I think we're going to have a very interesting conversation with you all. Maybe just to sort of kick us off, in the UK and Europe at least, there's been a lot of attention again recently on women on boards. And I wonder, Susanna, why the current focus, do you think? I think there's several reasons. Firstly, with society, the millennials into companies, different expectations around environmental social governance, politics. A few years ago, the defeat of Clinton, the election of Trump, I think there's been reappraisals of what was taken for granted a few years ago and demands for action. And on the business side, I think there's been a real change in the last 10 years from the situation 10 years ago where when we had a discussion about diversity, all the men around the table would say, well, is this still really a problem? To now having all the reports from the management consultancies which show the correlation of diversity with company performance and leadership. And once you have that data then you have the interesting conversations with senior management and investors as to what this means in terms of 
talent management, your consumer base, engagement with your investors, all of this. Thank you for that. I guess, Catherine, you obviously are calling in from Kenya. Does this resonate with you? Do you see the same interest at the moment in your part of the world? Very, very, very much so. In Kenya, we our constitution uh, that was just uh, promulgated a few years ago has mandated that for all public office, uh, women should rather not more than two thirds should be of the other gender. And so for public organizations where, which, uh, where seats were predominantly held by men are now putting in processes to ensure that they bring more ladies on board so that they can meet the constitutional uh, mandate. But speaking broadly about stakeholders, if you're doing business and you're not reaching out to half of your stakeholders, then you're not really doing good business. And you will not even achieve the results that you're looking to achieve. Because when we look at organizations across the globe, we see that at entry level, at least 50% or thereabouts is made up of women. But as we progress higher on uh, in the organization, women start to drop off. And so we want to address that, uh, the reasons why women drop out of uh, the corporate ladder. Uh, we want to fill the pipeline so that we make sure that there are women who are capable of leading organizations. So this resonates very much with me. Thank you, Catherine. And you touched upon a number of different issues there, and I'm sure we'll be exploring some of those during this conversation. But perhaps if I can turn first to Andrew. Andrew, I mean, we see very different approaches to increasing the number of women on boards, including mandatory quotas and, and voluntary targets. But I think increasingly we're seeing also supervisory demands, particularly in the financial services sector. The European Central Bank, for instance, is currently consulting on proposed changes to its fit and proper guide, clarifying its expectation when it comes to gender diversity in the management bodies of the banking entities it supervises. From your perspective, do some approaches work better than others in, in different sectors or perhaps even in different jurisdictions? I think, Susanna, this is a key question. And I, it's been a journey. I've, I've changed my view, actually. I used to think a few years back, Let's put codes of practice out there and trust people to do the right thing, comply or explain. But I think it needs to be more directional. I've recently stepped down as chairman of the Stock Exchange Listing Committee in Hong Kong, and we pushed policies much, much stronger on gender diversity and basically blocked any new IPO if it had a single gender board. And we've put out a recent consultation paper to effectively make single gender boards not in compliance with the listing rules. I'm increasingly thinking clarity of direction from regulators and possibly even quotas are a way to go. Why do I say that, Susanna? I say it because I think the issue is now very serious and the pace of change hasn't been good enough. And I think there needs the push from the very sophisticated millennials, the push from the institutional investors, the passive investors and the regulators, a sort of pincer movement needs to take place in order for action to, to actually happen. So I, I see the use of directions from regulators and possible a trend towards quotas as being a way of just being a catalyst. So basically proactive engagement with the marketplace, proactive statement of what expectation of what good looks like, and really challenging people that in the absence of representation of women on the board, how can you comply with good governance requirements? Thank you for that, Andrew. Maybe later, coming to you and staying in the same area in the EU, we now have legislative proposals on the table uh, relating to corporate reporting, which will most likely require enhanced reporting on gender diversity policies for all companies falling into scope. And the scope has been extended from sort of current uh, requirements. Do you think this, this might be a good way of accelerating change? May I recall a few years ago, six, seven years ago, another attempt by Vivian Redding for legislation calling for 40% women representation non-executive boards, which didn't go ahead and, you know, most European countries were against it. So this is a lighter version of it. It just you know, feeling that reporting will do the job. I, d I don't think that reporting will do the job, to be quite honest. Of course, mandatory disclosure is, is a good thing. You know, it's a step forward. 
and a publicly disclosed diversity policy and having measurable targets and reporting periodically and definitely on your annual corporate governance statement. But there are so many players in this area. They are the investors. And what are the investors doing? They've got their voting policies, fair enough. And when they engage with companies, they ask, you know, what percent of women you've got on board. But do the investors themselves or the rating agencies or international organizations that push towards diversity, what do they have on their board? What best practice do they have to show for themselves? So I think that a good step forward would be for investors and raters and all these people that vote for diversity to show their own best practices and to show that they first have diverse boards. Thank you, Leda. I'd like to move the discussion now a bit more onto targets and, and quotas. In the UK, where targets have been set but not quotas, recent data suggests that smaller listed firms are struggling to meet targets for women in the boardroom. Sir Catherine, I wonder if you have any thoughts as to whether it's realistic to expect smaller companies, or indeed all companies, whatever their business, to meet the same targets. I am in agreement that all companies, no matter how small, no matter how big, should actually meet their targets. You see, in corporate governance, we talk about that the size of the board should be aligned to the complexity and size of the business. So if you have a board of five, perhaps because your company is not so big, that board too should ensure, you should ensure that it meets, you meet the, the targets for a board of five. If your board is made up of 10 members, similarly. So in Kenya here, we talk about uh, every company should have a diversity and skills matrix. That diversity and skills matrix should actually uh, set out all the parameters that should be met. The issue about diversity on boards, gender parity in particular, is about good business. It's about being able to connect with your stakeholders. It's about reaching the customer base. And we know for a fact that across the world, a lot of purchasing decisions, I'm not talking about who brings in the money, I'm talking about purchasing decisions, are actually made by women. And so if you're not able to connect to that stakeholder who's making the purchasing decisions as a business, then you're losing out. And so however small you are, however big you are, I think you need to meet the same targets for the size and complexity that you have in place. That's some good points there. That's a very interesting perspective. But Leda, aside from setting quotas, which I'll discuss next, if we wish to continue with a system of voluntary targets, what should we do if the targets are missed? And many companies seem to be missing them. Should we do anything? Definitely. That's why I would support not voluntary targets, but um, I would support quotas. In Greece, we did have um, voluntary targets for quite a few years via the Hellenic Corporate Governance Code, as in many other countries have voluntary targets. Voluntary targets were the first choice for many countries, but when they were not met, and because it's this comply or explain approach we have for our corporate governance in Europe, then not much really happens. There's no, there's no name and shame. There's, there's, no, there's no real punishment for it. So I think uh, that the voluntary target um, question or idea should not be part of the solution. The solution is um, to have quarters, not, not high quarters, but maybe, you know, start with a 25 or 30 percent quarter in the first place. May I share something on that? Just just add as, add a little uh, point there. Any targets without teeth doesn't take you anywhere. Quarters would be the way to go uh, with very clear implications that our business would face if they don't meet the quarter. So targets with teeth for me is the way to go. Thank you. I think there is a lot of disquiet about targets because they're voluntary and they don't seem to be working. But Andrew, you mentioned quotas before and how you've sort of changed your views. But of course, one of the problems in the UK is that if you have a quota 
and any steps you take to reach that quota actually could run the risk of being unlawful under equality law because it could be to the disadvantage of male candidates and it undermines the principle of, a, of appointment on merit following objective assessment. I was wondering, Andrew, whether you think this is a fair point and how we can overcome that problem. I, I think um, when I said earlier, it's been a bit of a journey for me. It's not necessarily quotas. What, what it is, is moving beyond aspiration, moving beyond general statements of intent into measurement. And I, I think there is a way forward where clearly stated targets and reporting against the targets and then a consequence for not hitting a target is the next logical step before getting to quotas. Why do we mention targets, measurement and quotas? Is because there's just not enough momentum at the moment from a marketplace. And one thing I would say, one of the earlier questions is, I personally think it's totally unacceptable for people to give a suggestion that they're, they're not a small company may not be able to comply, other people may not be able to fulfill having women on board, but with a suggestion somehow that there aren't enough qualified women directors out there. And this is something I've been pushing really, really hard in Hong Kong with the Women's Foundation, 30% Club, etc., is how to change that way of thinking that there is a pool of very capable women ready and able and willing to work on, you know, on boards. So I would say probably stated targets and measurement and holding people to account as the first stage is probably the way to go. And then the end game, if one can't get change, is to go for quotas. But I recognize the issue you say with regard to the UK. So I, I think it's something probably less than quotas, but not just simple targets where we can find a way. I don't know quite what the formula is, but I think that's where the answer lies. I mean, the biggest thing is, that two other things. Is I think the first one is one can get more support if one sees it as diversity of perspectives and better governance, and a key angle of which is gender, as opposed to it being a pure gender discussion. And the second one is just to make it wholly unacceptable from an investor stock exchange regulator perspective to have no women on boards at all. You're listening to the ICAEW Insights in Focus podcast. And this idea that there's a limited pool of female talent or there's just not females available is one that's often raised and is actually quite irritating, as you say, Andrew. So turning to you, Susanna, I was wondering what you were thinking, whether women are valued when they are on the board. The gender pay gap at board level in the UK is, is apparently 23%. And the number of FTSE 100 financial directors currently who are women is about 15%. So the state, does this suggest that even if women are appointed, they are still undervalued in some way? Yes, I believe that this is true. There are various pieces of research around, for example, hard versus soft skills, where women more often have the soft skills. And McKinsey has shown that I think return on investment is double for hard skills rather than soft skills. Women have challenges in being perceived as nice and competent at the same time. It's usually frequently one or the other. The same performance, the same comment from women, not men, may not be valued the same. And if we look at the pay, I think the more you go into merit-based payments, and you look at things like bonuses rather than pay or pensions, the gap gets even higher when you move away from the pure pay. And finally, in the pandemic, we see that the unpaid labour gap has probably doubled. Thank you for that, Susanna. I just wanted to return to some of that discussion we were just having on the pool of qualified women directors, if I may. There's also a lot of evidence that you need a certain number of board directors to effect change. So there's a lot of talk about the power of three. It takes three underrepresented voices in a boardroom to truly change internal dynamics. So just looking at that discussion we had on that pool, what else do we need to do to boost the share of women on board? So we hear anecdotally that also that women may not always put themselves forward for such roles. Catherine, maybe I can turn to you. Does more, in your view, does more need to be done? And if so, what can be done to encourage more women to think of applying for board roles? Indeed, that's one of the reasons why Women on Boards uh, Network Kenya was formed which is that irritating question of, but we can't find them. Or even the one we have on the board does not even speak. So what we did is uh, we said we'll form this organization so that we can have a pool of board-ready women and a very readily shareable 
database that uh, whenever somebody is looking for a board director, we can always say, hey, here are five CVs, choose from these CVs, whoever you think best fits your organization. So we are doing a number of uh, initiatives which I would like to share, and, and, and I think these initiatives apply across the globe. At least some of the women organizations that I have uh, worked with and interacted with have seen that happen. One is mentorship. Mentorship is a big thing, and, and we do want to ensure that there are mentorship opportunities for women in this uh, C-suite who are capable of sitting on boards, so that quickly that is one. The second one is just building that confidence within the women themselves, so encouraging them to put themselves forward saying to them that, uh, well, there's really nothing to worry about. Just put yourself forward. You're equally qualified. Three is having them write very good board profiles. Many of us women will not package ourselves so well that our CV speaks to certain boards. So just profiling ourselves and making sure that we are properly profiled. And then the other thing that I have found which is very useful is preparing the women for the boardroom in terms of corporate governance training. Uh, so we are running a number of corporate governance training uh, forums. We are having the women network with uh, leaders across Kenya so that they can then use those opportunities to seek board positions. We are also asking women to share any board opportunities that they come across. We are reaching out to the women in the C-suite to just encourage them to start to apply for board positions. We are also starting at a very young age of 12 to start talking to them about sitting on boards. So all these initiatives. And then, of course, uh, within the organizations, if organizations can be encouraged to put in place gender-friendly policies, that encourages women to rise to the top of the organization and therefore to also position themselves for board positions. Thank you for that, Catherine. This is a very interesting list. But perhaps if I turn it around later, maybe I, I come to you next. So we looked at it from the individual perspective or the women's perspective. But is there more that companies should be doing in terms of bringing women onto the board? So are there good practices that companies are adopted that you're seeing? The first thing that should be done is that the tone has to come from the top. So the company and the board itself has to show commitment. And when I'm talking about the board, I'm talking basically about the executives on the board. So the commitment has to come from the top executives. Then the nomination committee has to play a role there. The nomination committee should in their report, in their yearly report, explain how they have considered the presentation of women when they select directors and, um, and report on that, but not use a boilerplate wording, but uh, really, you know, explain what they did and, and how they've done it and how they have pushed this idea to the executive um, search firm. So, second thing is that recruitment, so diversity needs to be improved in the recruitment. So, when you have women in leadership positions, these women can then take positions on the board, executive or non-executive. And what we really miss at the moment is more executive women on the board. When you have quarters, these positions turn to be filled by non-executive roles, non-executive people. But uh, what we really need to see, because we lack, is executives in, um, on the board. Now, I read the other day a, a very interesting report from an international labour organisation, and they said that the three main barriers were family responsibilities, gender stereotypes, and masculine corporate culture. So these are the three top barriers. So eliminating these barriers, then we could promote diversity in the boardroom. But in order to do that, you have to develop the culture first. So you have to develop a, a diversity culture in the company and eliminate masculine corporate culture. Obviously, professional development helps as Catherine said before, especially in the areas which are dominated by men. 
for example, you usually see men to be chief executive officers and chief financial officers. And these are the two executive positions that uh, investors look to find on the board because a good board, as we all know, should be filled by mostly by non-executive roles. So training women or when you recruit people, go for women for chief executive roles or CFO roles in the succession planning as well for these two positions. I think that would be a way to go for it. Thank you, Leda. I mean, staying on this topic of executive roles, Andrew, are, are we having the wrong debate in some ways here? Should we be focusing more on career progression rather than women at the very top on the boards? I think it's all connected, isn't it? How can organisations provide a more supportive environment during different stages of, of careers uh, for women in order that the pipeline of very senior talent has more women in it? And I I think this is a fundamental issue, uh, which many organizations need to address. Actually, I'm very pleased. Uh, KPG in Hong Kong, 50% of our partners are are women. It's very important, but we've got to ask ourselves, what did they go through in order to get to that position? Was there enough support? Was there enough? Should it have been more? I think you're right to raise it. It is the talent pipeline and how organizations have policies which facilitate the development of women and take into account specific situations and, uh, you know, in many ways, conflicting priorities so that women can have it all and there doesn't have to be choices. Or if there is choices at particular times, later on, those choices are compensated. So I think it's a fundamental mindset from a tone at the top, which is the key. Just uh, one final point is I have a lot of friends to women on boards, and they said exactly what was mentioned earlier, that there's no point just being one or two voices. You need at least three on the board for there to be change. And so one thing I would encourage is that women who are already on boards encourage on their boards and others that women to stand up and and take the opportunity and put themselves forward. I think there is bias uh, out there in the market. And uh, the more that women who are successful on boards can champion the cause and encourage others and be even more role models to others, uh, the better. Thank you, Andrew. Susanna, maybe I'll I'll pass to you. You you hold various non-executive roles. How do you see it from your position on different kinds of boards? I think what boards need is to understand the situation they're in. So I'm actually a great fan of gender audits so that boards genuinely know where they're at and they're not relying on opinions like there aren't enough women out there, etc., which aren't backed up by data. So I think actually there's a huge role here for the accountancy and audit profession to help boards look at where they are, look at what the main problems in that particular company are and then to tackle those specific problems rather than to try and impose a generic one-size-fits-all on the company that perhaps doesn't match the problems that the company is facing. In terms of women on boards or career progression, I think if we want to be truly strategic and change the system, then longer-term career progression is more important because it touches all levels, whereas women on boards is always going to be a small number. And if you can change the system across all the levels, then you will also change the numbers of women on boards. Thank you. And I think we've seen there's still quite a way to go with um, increasing female participation on boards and career progression generally. So I was wondering, Catherine and Susanna, whether this teaches us anything about how to enhance broader diversity on boards. Catherine, have you any thoughts? Yes, this teaches us a lot about other diversity that we need on the board. I do practice uh, corporate governance on boards. And one of the things that I advocate for is that it's not just about gender diversity, but it's about diversity in all forms and kinds that you need on the board. Depending on your strategy as an organization, depending on where you're going, depending on your future, what sort of diversity do you need on your board? So if you're a bank, for example, that is catering for many of your clients are 20-something, 30-something, and yet the average age on the board is 75. Who is telling you about what the younger people need? So you do need to also think about age diversity on your board. You do need to think about regional diversity on your board. You do need to think about 
uh, diversity on skills on your board. So all these things that we are discussing in terms of gender diversity also apply to other forms of diversity that would be needed on the board. But I must add that whatever diversity you have on your board, it must speak to your stakeholders, it must speak to your strategy and where you're going in the future. Yes, that's a very important point. Uh, and Suzanne, I wondered if you had anything to add on the issue from your perspective and experience. I think there are two slightly different lessons. So some lessons are universal. So you need to listen to the groups that are affected and not decide for them what is best for them and impose it from on high. You need to get data on the real problems within the company and then match the solutions to the problems. You need to engage the senior management and you need to keep testing to see if what you're doing actually works. What will work may differ for the problems that women experience versus the problems that other groups experience. So you need to adapt your strategies to the reality on the ground. Yeah, so it's not a one-size-fits-all, I think. And finally, I'd like to end by asking all of you to say in 30 seconds what your hopes for the future with regard to gender equality on boards. Is it achievable or is it just a pipe dream? Andrew, if I could ask you first. I think uh, gender diversity is definitely achievable. I think the best strategy, certainly in my part of the world, is the overall diversity of perspectives approach and broader diversity on the board of which gender is the primary one, but there's cultural and also age. So I'm very positive about this, but I feel we need to get a pincer movement from regulators and investors and broader society to either get quotas or this sort of managed targets approach so that people feel they'll be measured. And as a consequence, if they're not able to, to do what we think is probably the right thing from a governance perspective. Later. Yeah, I think diversity is here to stay. As Andrew said, there's no turning back. So it can only get better, but we need quarters. We need strong commitment from regulators, investors, corporations. And I think that we need to have men advocate for a balanced boards. Catherine? I think uh, gender diversity is very much achievable. It just needs for decision makers, for policy makers, to be committed to doing the right thing. It is a matter for the heart and the mind. I am doing this because I believe this is the right, not necessarily because the law is behind us, but we must do the right thing. And the right thing is that our stakeholders must be represented at the decision-making table. And women are very much part of society and they must therefore be represented at the decision-making table. Thank you. And so, Susanna, it may be the right thing, but is it achievable? I think it's achievable over time. I think we should aim for 50-50. And if necessary, we break it down into stages. So in the past, it's been so 12 to 20, 25, 33, 40, 45, 50 percent. So you keep breaking it down into smaller chunks to make it more achievable and you keep focusing on the business needs. If 60% of graduates are female and the majority of your consumers are female and you want your company still to be here in five to ten years time, you'd better have a plan on gender because otherwise your rivals who do will overtake you. So I think everybody's positive, but it's just going to take a, a bit longer. So it only reminds, remains for me to say on behalf of myself, Susanna and ICAW, a sincere thank you to all our panellists for such an interesting and informed discussion. I'd also like to say thank you to our audience. I hope you found this as thought-provoking as I did. If you'd like to know more about ICAW's work on this issue, please visit our website and search for our Women in Finance page. And I hope you will join us again soon. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you want to hear more from ICAEW, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.